We're going to try and get through all the questions, Mr Hancock, so we've finished your evidence this morning in one go. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Mr Jacobs, I think. Good morning, Mr Hancock. Good morning. Some, some questions on behalf of the Trade Union Congress. Um, firstly, on vaccination as a condition of employment. Okay. Yeah. Um, you were asked questions on this topic yesterday in connection with ethnic minority groups. Yeah. Um, you described some groups feeling less connected to authorities, as you put it, and you described the importance of developing trust, using trusted voices and so on. Does imposing vaccination as a condition of employment not actually work against those factors? So in relation to groups feeling connected to authorities, you have a mandatory direction from authority with a severe sanction of loss of employment, and it also really abandons attempts at trust and persuasion. Um, actually, the, uh, the experience that we had with vaccination as a condition of deployment in social care uh, led to the exactly the opposite conclusion. Uh, vaccination rates increased, um, and I think most people uh, in employment in care settings understood and understand that so. part of their um, responsibility, I suppose, is not to infect the people they're caring for with a potentially deadly disease. So. Um, obviously, I understand those concerns, and they, we, anybody introducing can, um, a, uh, a vaccination as a condition of deployment uh, should be uh, sensitive to those concerns. Um, but ultimately, um, the, the imperative of uh, saving lives is, is more important. But, but going back to the focus of my question, Mr Hancock, if you're right to say that there's a problem of some groups feeling less connected to authority, um, that authority saying, take the vaccine or lose your job, the reality is that's going to be a problem, isn't it? Well, the reality is best understood by looking at what happened when we introduced this in social care and exactly the opposite happened. So there were those concerns raised and there were the concerns raised that um, tens of thousands of people would leave employment. That isn't what happened. Um, and I think it isn't what happened because <laughs> vaccines, clinically proven vaccines, are safe and effective. And I think the moral obligation to save lives is more important. You often get this in government when, you know, there is a, when you're looking at the best interests of, the, of, the, of society as a whole, there are some strong voices who are opposed to something. You know, there's not just people who are hesitant at taking the vaccine, but there's some um, anti-vaxxers who spread misinformation. Um, and there's some people who get very upset at things, um, even though they're the right thing to do. So I understand the argument, um, but it isn't borne out by evidence. Well, in terms of evidence and experience, we, we've heard evidence, for example, from Professor Ball from a trust in Birmingham, who described vaccination as a condition of employment in healthcare, having a very significant impact both on unvaccinated staff, but also vaccinated staff who were worried about what was going to happen to their colleagues. So do you accept that as a reality of, of the impact of this sort of measure? Well, this measure wasn't brought in in healthcare. So I understand that some people make those uh, arguments in advance and say that's what's going to happen. But as I say, when we brought this in in social care, exactly those arguments were advanced and turned out not to be accurate. But even if they were accurate, even if there were concerns, the life-saving imperative has, in my view, a, uh, a, a, an overriding um, uh, moral value that requires uh, and demands that this policy is the right one. Um, so, uh, of course, I understand those concerns, and we discussed them and considered them ahead of bringing this in in social care, um, but they are not borne out by um, reality, as you put it, um, and, um, and, and even if there were, even if they were, uh, you would have to, you have to consider the fact that if you don't have this, then you have people who are going into work with a higher chance of entirely unintentionally giving somebody in their care a disease that leads to their death. And it is as stark as that. So for me, this is a, a, a it's a cut and dried issue. Um, and I'm very, very pleased with how it went in social care because it went very well. In, in terms of the moral imperative that you described to take the vaccine, 
Do, do you at least recognise that there may be a moral imperative that points the other way, which is that with healthcare workers who have been putting their lives on the line through the earliest, most dangerous stages of a pandemic, to say to them, you're now out of a job unless you take the vaccine. There's also a, mer a moral imperative against doing that. It may be something that points both ways. As I say, you have to consider all of these things, absolutely. There is a, um, there is a, uh, there is a counter argument, uh, but the, but the life-saving moral imperative absolutely overrides that, not least because vaccinating people um, uh, who are in these dangerous settings, like working in a hospital, um, it, it's good for them as well as good for their patients. So even if you're not, even if, even if you take away, as you seem to want to, the moral imperative in terms of protecting the lives of people who go into hospital, it's, at, it's good for the staff themselves as well. So uh, your, um, it, it, to say there's a balance is accurate, um, but in this case, the, uh, the scales of that imperative are very heavily weighed in favour of using science to save people's lives. And certainly my clients agreed with that in the sense of um, promoting use of vaccine, seeking to assist the NHS in achieving high levels of vaccination within staff. But do you think there might be a case for saying that because of the downsides, persuasion and using trust is actually um, more effective in the round than um, applying the, the, the sanction which, which you invite the inquiry to suggest? Nope. I think that uh, if somebody doesn't want to um, uh, to use the science that's available in order to protect the people they care for, uh, then it's entirely appropriate that they should seek employment elsewhere. Is there a lack of balance in your view, Mr Hancock? Um, there's, uh, Churchill once said, uh, I am um, partial as between the fire brigade and the fire, and that applies in this. I've considered it very deeply. And I think that the, um, uh, the, the, the clarity of what is right in this issue is uh, absolutely uh, clear. Uh, next topic, please. Um, Nightingale hospitals and um, staffing. Um, you described yesterday that, that the Nightingales were to operate within the auspices of the relevant trust and the trust would be responsible for staffing, if I understand your evidence correctly. Um, and also that nightingales would be used when the capacity of existing hospitals could stretch no further. Is that right? Broadly, yeah. If they are to be used in circumstances that existing capacity could really stretch no further, was it ever r really realistic to think that at that point the trusts could then provide thousands of staff for thousands of extra beds in additional hospitals? Uh, yes, uh, and that is what was uh, planned. Um, and of course, it would be difficult. Of course, it would be challenging. But a combination of bringing more people back into service, uh, for instance, those who uh, retired um, or were working in uh, private health care, um, and, uh, and also at stretching ratios, as we discussed yesterday, the combination of those two things made this doable. I'm not saying it was easy. Uh, but it was, but it was doable, uh, and it was. It would have been critical had we not managed to stem the spread of the virus when we did. You, you say boldly, yes, Mr. Hancock. Yeah. But it, it, we've heard about these being used when staffing ratios in intensive care is already one to six. Yeah. So, so where do these where do these intensive care specialists appear from? Well, the combination, as I said, of um, bringing people in um, who immediately prior to the pandemic weren't working in um, healthcare, for instance, qualified uh, nurses who had recently retired. Um, so, plus so, the... Sorry, just to pause you there, Mr Hancock. Have they not been brought in already to, to assist with existing <coughs> hospital capacity? Yes, the combination of bringing those in, them in, and bringing it and stretching ratios meant that uh, we were able to service more physical capacity. So, as you know, the, to, to deliver an effective hospital bed and a hospital effective hospital treatment, you need the staff and you need the uh, physical equipment. And um, by, by building the physical um, hospital and by stretching staff ratios and bringing in more staff, 
uh, you could therefore enhance the number of beds. So, yeah. But uh, the, my point is, my central point is, I, I know this is an enormous challenge, but it was doable. And um, to the degree that it was needed in, in, in those hospitals which did take patients, um, we did it. I think I'm at my time. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hancock. you, Mr. Jacobs. Mr. Stanton, Mr. Stanton's behind you as well, Mr. Hancock, I'm afraid. Good morning, Mr. Hancock. Um, <clears throat> I ask questions on behalf of the British Medical Association. Mm. Um, I'd like to ask you about staff burnout uh, mm. and the trauma they experienced. Yeah. Uh, the context is the circumstances we heard uh, described yesterday by yeah. Professor Fong. Um, and with regard to the fact that um, survey responses to Professor Fong and his team uh, reported symptoms of serious mental illness, um, including severe depression, severe anxiety, and PTSD yeah. among ICU staff yeah. at a level of approximately 50%. Um, I recognize uh, from your evidence that you have personally uh, witnessed and experienced uh, those circumstances as well. Um, but I'd like to ask you, were you aware um, that the levels of trauma experienced by healthcare workers were of that magnitude? Uh, yes, I was. And, and you, know, you acknowledge that I witnessed and to a degree experienced this. And of course, and I worked <coughs> incredibly hard, but not nearly in the same way as those who were experiencing Extremely this and the, and the death directly day in, day out in intensive care. So um, I, I'm grateful for you acknowledging that I spent as much time as I could on the, on, on the wards, but it was nothing like those who worked full time in intensive care. Um, the, um, I, I, I am aware of the figures the right that you quote. Uh, it was something that we were worried about from the, uh, from the start. Um, it is a, a consequence of the enormous pressures and the deadly nature of the virus, absolutely. Thank you. Um, can I ask you about um, the general points at which um, you became aware that, that this was such a significant issue? Yeah. And can I ask um, how that factored into some of your strategic decision making and also engagement with your senior colleagues? I'm thinking about the period between the first and second waves when healthcare workers and the NHS generally desperately needed to recover. And also um, from your evidence yesterday when you described speaking to a doctor in distress yeah. who told you uh, that there must not be a, th a third wave. So uh, at that point, um, we were worried about a third wave because it had taken us so long to win the argument for the necessary lockdown second time round. And thankfully, because of the vaccine, um, that wasn't that didn't happen. And um, uh, uh, that was... Um, well, thank goodness for that. The, um, um, the, the, we put in place measures um, as much as we could and as early as we could. Uh, this included, for instance, introducing uh, well-being and recovery areas where possible, supporting hospitals to do that. That was really a hospital, hospital by hospital decision rather than one that um, we implemented uh, directly. I spoke to the, the BMA and other unions regularly throughout this, um, throughout this period in order to, uh, to understand these pressures and see what we could do. Uh, there were contractual changes in some places in order to uh, uh, try to make sure that the, uh, the problems were mitigated, but the, it was very much mitigation because of you know, what was effectively a, um, a, a wartime attitude in the intensive care um, and, uh, and other settings across, across the NHS. Thank you. Um, could I um, ask you about the uh, sort of uh, type of support and the uh, uh, strategic um, way in which that support was put in place? And just taking uh, an extreme example, obviously with a single individual who would be experiencing mental health issues. Yeah. That is absolutely for the employer uh, yeah. to deal with and um, deal with at that level. When you have um, <clears throat> um, uh, issues at, at this level, re reports of approximately 50% of staff experiencing severe anxiety, et cetera, 
Do you think um, a more central um, role yeah. and uh, leadership was was required? Not necessarily from you, but NHS England, for example. Yes. So there's absolutely a need for national measures when, as well as local measures, when there's something of this scale. Um, for instance. Uh, NHS England put in place a, uh, a first port of call phone line, um, essentially, you know, an emergency mental health phone line for uh, for NHS staff. Uh, and it was something that the chief people officer in NHS England uh, was engaged on and very concerned about. You're right to say that the formal accountability um, was with NHS England rather than uh, rather than the department because NHS England, uh, but the individual employer is of course the, the, the trust, the GP surgery, um, or the, the, the local NHS institution. So um, there, were, there was a need for national and local measures. And if there's further things that can be put in place earlier in the future, then I think that uh, the BMA is very well placed to recommend them. Thank you. And a final question, Mr. Hancock. Um, how can we avoid this level of trauma um, in future pandemics, future health emergencies? The absolute number one thing that we can do to avoid this sort of trauma for NHS staff is to bring in lockdown measures early in response to a pandemic level uh, pathogen. And I think that um, th those who understand the consequence of waiting before bringing in measures that are going to be necessary um, need to unite to win that argument. There are still people making the argument that lockdown wasn't necessary or in future we should try we should we should try to do without it i think that is uh false wrong and dangerous and um it, we should and, uh, and the case needs to continue to be made so that should a pandemic potential pathogen hit at which could happen at any time uh, we're ready um, and i come back to the doctrine that i set out in the first um module uh, which I think uh, is uh, uh, has 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 yet to be challenged. There needs to be a national debate, in my view, about how we respond immediately, um, and um, and again, the BMA would play an important role in that. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Thank you, my lady. Good morning, Mr. Hancock. Questions on behalf of clinically vulnerable families. Um, I've got two areas to ask you about. The first is shielding. Um, you say in your statement that you, you, in your view, shielding saved many hundreds of thousands of lives. Is that is that fair? Yes, it's very very difficult to estimate, um, but it was a huge program, and um, I, uh, I I think it, it's likely to be in that order of magnitude. Is that based on any scientific um, study, or is it? Yes, it's based on. It's my best estimate based on the number of people who were in the shielding program, the uh, the risks that they faced should they catch COVID, which of course by its nature was much higher than the general population, um, and the um, the the likely reduction in the. Uh, in transmission amongst those who were shielding, but it's it, it's very hard to know for sure. Yeah. So, it's, is, so is that your estimate, or is it uh, is it somebody's given you that estimate? There was some internal work done uh, before I left office, uh, but the challenge because the the statistical challenges because there isn't a control group by because we chose to um, support everybody rather than have a control group. Um, it is not possible to get a a, a um, an estimate that the government is happy to um, put its um, imprimatur to, uh, for for uh, because there's because these statistics are very hard actually to assess. I, I want to ask you about what what might have been done differently mm. to improve the shielding program. Um, just picking up on some evidence you gave yesterday, um, would you agree that the by definition the clinically extremely vulnerable group? who were involved in the shielding programme would also have to access healthcare settings, particularly hospitals, quite a bit more than your average uh, member of the population. Uh, yes, absolutely. That is, that is by, then, by, by the nature of the group, that is likely to be true. And, and you said in evidence yesterday that hospitals are dangerous places in pandemics. The estimate is that more people caught COVID in hospitals than almost any other setting. And that's often 
forgotten. I just yes. want to ask you about the, 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 the combination of those factors. It, 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 wasn't there a problem with shielding that you were protecting people at home? Yes. Um, but they were also the people who were having to go to hospitals. And wasn't it the case that, in, in a sense, that you were protecting people from the frying pan at home but sending them into the fire in, in hospitals and therefore not really giving protection at all? Uh, no, that's, that, that's, that, I think you were, I, I was agreeing with you until the last bit. Um, <laughs> when a pandemic hits... You don't have a choice between no pandemic and the actions that you take. You have a choice between how to minimise the impact of a pandemic. So in a way, it comes back to the, pre the last answer that I gave to the BMA, which is we need to make sure that we have a doctrine that brings in lockdown er as early, as soon as you know that you're going to have to do it, you should bring it in. And that... Um, that, that is a hard judgment to know that you're going to need NPIs, but as soon as you do, there is no benefit and no trade-off from not bringing them in immediately. This is particularly important and acute for uh, the clinically, those who are clinically extremely vulnerable to whatever pathogen has come along. Um, but to argue that uh, shielding didn't work because the people who were shielded need hosp needed hospital treatment, they were going to need hospital treatment anyway. So what shielding did was protect them as much as possible from infection in the community. Um, but the best thing to do to protect them from uh, um, in hospital is reduce nosocomial infection and reduce the overall level of infection uh, across the country. So it, it absolutely doesn't follow logically that because shield, people who are shielding have to go to hospital, therefore you shouldn't do shielding. That's, that's, that's not true. Well, well I, I, that, that wasn't what I was putting. It's more about how to improve the programme. OK. And, and when you get into hospitals, yeah. if you can't improve things like ventilation, um, you know, uh, testing, those sorts of things in the early days, yeah. doesn't it make the shielding programme much less effective for, the, for that group it, taken overall? No. Because you have to protect people who are clinically extremely vulnerable from community-acquired infection and from hospital-acquired infection. Uh, and to say that shielding is only a partial solution is reasonable, but to say that it is no solution because it can't be the whole solution is false. Yeah, so, so you'll agree it, it, it's only part of a picture which has to include protecting people in healthcare settings as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just in relation to shielding from the perspective of the shielded, Dr Catherine Finnis of CVF gave evidence to this inquiry that many of those advised to shield felt that the messaging was frightening and the effect was in one sense to disempower people by impressing on them the need to shield without providing them with sufficient information about the risks of COVID-19 and the steps that could be taken to manage them. Would you agree, Mr Hancock, with the evidence of Professor McBride, the CMO for Northern Ireland, and I'm quoting, that the approach that was taken in good faith initially did not fully think through the loss of agency and the loss of control that people would experience? So I take that, um, that evidence seriously, but I also have to counterbalance it with the strong evidence we got of the uh, support for the communications that we uh, uh, put out to those who were shielding, directly communicating with, um, with them. I wrote a number of times to the shielding population and their, and their GPs were encouraged to, um, to follow up. So there were very strong voices on the other side as well. And when you're dealing with a group of um, uh, up to 2 million people who are clinically extremely vulnerable, um, the, the virus itself is extremely frightening. The virus, it's the virus that's frightening um, because it, 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 it's killing people. Um, being able to communicate effectively um, is incredibly important and hence writing directly. And I, put, I took personal trouble to make sure those letters were as empathetic as possible, understanding these concerns. Um, however, the, the question you've always got to ask is what is the alternative? Um, and... I understand the point about agency, and we didn't make any of the shielding measures 
um, required, they were advice, and we were clear that it was advice, and therefore agency was retained. But I understand the impact of being told by the Secretary of State or the Chief Medical Officer that this is what you are recommended to do. Um, so we always so sought to strike that balance. Um, with respect to improving the shielding programme, I absolutely think that we should um, we should go over it and discuss it and um, be prepared to make it better next time round. As we did throughout, we iterated many times during the pandemic to try to improve this. But I think it would be wrong just to take the view of one side of this debate when, in fact, amongst those who are clinically vulnerable, there was essentially a spectrum of views all the way through from tell me exactly what I ought to do to uh, don't tell me what to do, I'll work it out for myself. And there's, a, and, 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 and there's every view in between. But do, do you agree, just going back to that question, that, that one area that could be improved was empower, empowering people more with information? So, for example, giving them good information about what kind of masks they could wear and to go out into the community, ventilation, that sort of thing, to make it just a bit more empowering for, for people who didn't want to um, just stay in their homes if they could avoid it. We tried to do that as much as possible, um, yes. But you, you've got to remember, again, that the responsibility that I had towards the shielding population was not only to ensure that we got that population right, and Jenny Harries did a huge amount of high-quality work to do that, and we expanded it over time, um, but also to take into account the response from all those who are shielding, not just those who were vocal and in campaign groups. And it's and 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 do it. You you know the my I was always focused on the fact that my responsibility was to society as a whole and in particular to those who are most vulnerable um, and therefore tried to get as broad a range of feedback as possible. Finally, on, on um, DNA CPRs, do not attend um, CPR uh, orders, CVF is concerned that there remain people to this day who may not be aware that a DNA CPR notice was issued uh, for them um, during the pandemic. For, for that reason, and to restore trust and confidence in the advanced care planning process more widely, um, CVF has been advocating for a systemic review of all DNA CPRs put in place in early 2020, um, and that the notes of all the formerly shielded people from early 2020 be reviewed. Do you recall any consideration being given to that kind of review and, and would you support that going forward? I, I certainly think a review like that should be looked at um, because it, it, it's obvious that there were cases when um, DNR notices were, um, were wrongly applied and I think the issue of consent is so important here. Um, to answer your question specifically about whether we looked at this, I can't recall us looking at a review like that because our absolutely prime motivation was to stop that from happening in the first instance. Um, and I'd left office by the time we we're in a position then to do the, the review and look back. Um, but now, of course, we're no longer in a pandemic. And so now would be an appropriate moment to consider doing that. Thank you. Those are my questions. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, Ms. Polishek, who's sitting beside Mr. Wagner. Thank you. Uh, I ask questions on behalf of 13 pregnancy, baby and parenting organisations. And I have one topic of questions on one of their key concerns, the visiting restrictions, yeah. which impacted women and pregnant people, but also new mothers, the newly bereaved and their families when having support in health care. Is it right that you were made aware, including, for example, in a meeting with the charity Bliss on the 7th of September 2020, that a core concern amongst these groups was that many hospitals were implementing the visiting restrictions very differently and therefore creating, in effect, a postcode lottery and, in turn, anxiety amongst many women and pregnant people about what support they would be allowed? Uh, yes, and more so than that, my first meeting on this subject that, um, that I can recall and have found the evidence from um, was in June 2020, um, and I was concerned to get the balance right uh, from, the, from, the, from the start. It, there is a balance here between protecting people from infection 
uh, and the, uh, the uh, very, very strong need for companionship in, uh, in birth or bereavement. Um, but um, this was a concern. I remember the meeting with Bliss and I think Alicia Cairns MP. Thank you. And it's right that initial drafts of nationwide visiting guidance, uh, which were later published in December 2020, were shared with your private secretary. And that visiting guidance would have imposed obligations on NHS trusts to implement with immediate effect women having access to a support person at all times during the maternity journey. Were you supportive of that policy direction? Uh, yes, I was. And one of my advisers in particular, I asked to stay close to this to make sure that, it, uh, that, 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 that I was continued to be uh, properly advised on it. Were you made aware that there was resistance from the Royal College of Midwives and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecology to those initial drafts, and that consequently amendments to the draft guidance resulted in those directions to NHS trusts being toned down? Yes. Um, as I say, there was a balance in this argument, and we have to take into account the balance and the need to um, mitigate the spread. Uh, of the of the disease, I come back to the point that hospitals are dangerous places in pandemics. Um, but nevertheless, I was uh, I was very keen that we get a, uh, a, a a set of guidance out that was appropriate and supported by those like um, the groups that you uh, that you represent. But j just to be clear, did you then understand as a result that that NHS visiting guidance? continued to allow for localised variation and therefore maintained, in effect, the postcode lottery? Uh, yes. Uh, the argument in favour of that was that um, during the autumn of 2020, the level of disease was very different in different parts of the country. And there may be areas, for instance, that were in the higher tiers of what was then the tiering system, uh, where, uh, where a lack of visitors altogether was appropriate in extremis. Um, I understand there's, there's, group, there's some groups who think that that should never be the case, um, but th this was the, the debate and, and um, uh, we had to take all considerations into account. But I was broadly on the side of ensure there's a visit uh, and ensure a companion, a single companion can make a huge difference. And that was the side of the debate I was on. And just coming to that balance, Mr Hancock, the inquiry has heard evidence from Jill Walton of the Royal College of Midwives, who was frank that one of the reasons her union did not endorse even the toned down version of that guidance was because of the perceived risk to staff from COVID-19 infection. And her evidence specifically was that testing and greater access to PPE earlier for both support partners and staff absolutely and she said definitely would, have facilitated further visiting. We've talked generally about PPE shortages and you've given evidence on that, but were you aware of those specific concerns about PPE shortages in maternity care? Um, I, I wasn't at the time, but I am now. Um, I would say with respect both to PPE and especially with testing, um, there are many, many examples of things that can be done better if you can expand your testing fast enough. That's why I was... Uh, um, had my shoulder to the wheel on that in a very public way um, to try to make the expansion of testing happen as quickly <coughs> as possible. And this is just one heart-rending example of why it's important. Yeah, and you've, I think you've said that you, you weren't aware of those at the time, so, so those concerns about PPE and maternity care. So does it follow that you didn't discuss any specific <laughs> steps that the NHS could have taken to at the time to allay those concerns of midwives and other maternity staff in order to try and open up visiting for, for the impacted woman you've identified? Well, the truth is that we, we went into this without a testing system, right? Um, and so it simply wasn't an available choice. Um, the, uh, there was a clinical um, ordering of the prioritisation for tests. And my job was not to affect that clinical prioritisation, which um, which companions for uh, women giving birth would have been one example of. My job was to expand the number of tests available so we could get as far down that list as possible. Um, the first, so the first time I engaged on this subject was in June 2020, as, as that testing became more widely available and as we came out of the first stage of 
of lockdown. But but having uh, engaging on it any earlier, um, without the testing to be able to expand that, and without and with severe shortages in PPE, um, wouldn't have. I don't think even with hindsight wouldn't have made much difference. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. My lady, those are my questions. Mr. Burton, Mr. Burton's over there. Good morning, Mr. Hancock. I ask questions on behalf of the Disability Charities Consortium, who speak on behalf of some 17 million disabled people in the UK. Uh, in October 2020, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Sir Right Honourable Michael Gove MP, wrote to you and other Secretaries of State uh, asking, on behalf of the Prime Minister, for greater ambition in tackling the terrible disparities highlighted by the pandemic. In that letter, Michael Gove said this, I want to draw your attention to the Prime Minister's request to departments to consider options for improving outcomes for those with disabilities ahead of a future COVID-O discussion. This is also extremely important work. I expect Secretary of State to work with their departments to bring much more ambitious and far-reaching proposals to that discussion as per the Prime Minister's steer. The Prime Minister has clearly directed his ministers to engage with this issue fully and develop a strong package of interventions. If we do, then I have complete confidence that this committee and our government can move the dial and prevent a replication of disproportionate impacts in the second wave. Mr Hancock, what did you do by way of bringing much more ambitious and far-reaching proposals yeah. to prevent a replication of disproportionate impacts on disabled people in the second wave? Uh, thank you. So this was obviously an incredibly important subject. I agree with the sentiments expressed by Michael in that letter. Um, and the the answer is the shielding program was the core to the response from the uh, health department. Uh, we anticipated from January 2020 that uh, people with disabilities may be more likely to be clinically extremely vulnerable uh, to COVID um, and more likely to be badly affected. And the uh, evidence sadly bore that out. There was a disproportionate impact in the first wave. Um, uh, in the summer and autumn of 2020, we expanded the clinically extremely vulnerable list and the shielding list as a consequence um, in order that a wider range of people get, got, more, um, uh, got more of that, the support that came with that package. The other thing that I did uh, personally was ensure that uh, people living with disabilities were higher up the uh, prioritization um, by, uh, for vaccines by accepting the uh, JCVI um, advice, uh, clinical advice on the prioritization of, uh, of vaccines. And so that was another important action that happened at that autumn. Mr. Hancock, just on the first of those, is it not correct that in relation to the CEV list, um, it's correct that people with Down syndrome were added to that list in autumn 2020, but no other disabled people were added to that list, were they? Uh, more disabled people were, not by group, <coughs> but by identification of more individuals. So the, 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 um, you're right to say that the criteria didn't expand, but the data work to find more people who needed to be within the existing criteria uh, meant that the list as a whole uh, grew quite considerably over the autumn. Do you mean the CV list rather than the CEV list? I mean the shielding list. I'm grateful. So my, my next question is uh, about mortality rates. Uh, in October 2020, um, the ONS established that six in 10 deaths that occurred between March and July 2020, i.e. the first wave, were of disabled people. That rate of disparity remained for the second wave, even when controlled for matters such as residence type, geography, socioeconomic and demographic factors, health characteristics, and indeed vaccination status. And disabled people therefore remained at a greater risk, a much greater risk of death than non-disabled people. In light of that, do you believe your department did enough to reduce disproportionate impacts on disabled people ahead of the second wave? We did everything we could. And the challenge is that the virus itself was uh, more aggressive against people living with disabilities, um, and that is a um, that is a, 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 a sad fact. Mr. Um, that, in the same way that it was more aggressive against people who were older, 
Um, so absolutely, we took action to reduce the total number of people affected and the disparities. Um, the, um, the the but the the disparities are a result of the nature of the virus. So you're saying disabled people were clinically more likely to die from COVID-19 than non-disabled people? That is the clear evidence from the data, yes. Would you be able to assist us with what evidence you're referring to, Mr Hancock? Um, yes, I'm very happy to write afterwards with it. I haven't got it to hand. I, I'm most grateful. Thank you very much, my lady. Thank you, Mr Blair. Mr Pisani, uh, he's uh, just long. Uh -huh. Mr Burton. Thank you, my lady. Mr. Hancock, I ask questions on behalf of MIND, the mental health charity. Um, the context of my question is this. Firstly, at paragraph four of your fifth witness statement, you say that the single most important fact about the NHS in the pandemic is that it was never overwhelmed. Although, of course, you do qualify that by saying that demand never exceeded capacity across the UK as a whole. As a whole, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the second part of the context of my question is um, the um, witness statement of Saffron Cordery, who is the Deputy Chief Executive of the NHS Providers Organisation, um, in which she says at paragraph 206, quote, Throughout the course of the relevant period, trust leaders highlighted to us that mental health services for children and young people faced a significant treatment gap prior to the pandemic, in addition to demand stemming from the pandemic. Yes. And at paragraph 209 of the same statement, she describes how in May 2021, uh, NHS providers conducted a survey of chairs and chief executives of mental health and learning disability trusts that provide mental health services for children and young people. The findings of that survey include <laughs> that 85% of respondents said they could not meet demand for children and young people's eating disorder services, and two-thirds said that they were not able to meet demand for community services and inpatient services. Yes. So my question is, in specific relation to children and young people's mental health inpatient capacity, yes. do you maintain that the NHS was never overwhelmed during the relevant period? Well, what I'd say to that is that this was a problem well before the pandemic. And in the 2018 uh, long-term plan, we increased the budget for mental health services faster than the NHS budget as a whole. And within that, for children's and young people's services, uh, the fastest, um, the faster still. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a clear and significant problem. Uh, in the NHS. It remains so today, irrespective of COVID. So um, I would say that these services were not overwhelmed by COVID. They were already under very significant pressure before the pandemic. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, my Thank lady. Thank you, Mr. Pisani. Uh, Ms. Hannett. Ms. Hannett's behind Mr. Pisani. <laughs> Mr Hancock, I ask questions on behalf of the long COVID groups. Uh, we're very grateful to Council to the Inquiry, who has already raised most of the issues with you that we wish to raise um, already. And one remaining question. Um, we know that healthcare workers are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, and so are also likely to be disproportionately impacted by long COVID. As you've already confirmed with Council to the Inquiry, even now there's no data being collected on the prevalence of long COVID amongst healthcare workers. Um, You've already stated that there should be data collected on the incidence of healthcare workers with long COVID. Do you agree that collecting data on staff absence due to long COVID would have been helpful in order to understand the overall capacity of the healthcare system? Yes, I do, yes. 
And do you agree that that would also have been helpful to have that data to all staff with long COVID, whether they're agency staff, privately employed staff, casual workers, non-clinical staff, i.e. even those not directly employed by the NHS? Uh, yes, and collecting the data in these circumstances for those not, as you say, not directly employed by the NHS is always more challenging. For instance, we discussed um, uh, private pharmacy services yesterday um, in a slightly different context, uh, but... Uh, I, I, I strongly agree. Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Ms. Hans. Uh, Mr. Simblett, who's just there. Good morning, Mr. Hancock. Uh, these questions are on behalf of the COVID Airborne Transmission Alliance, or CATA, which has been referred to already in the questioning yesterday. It's an organisation of healthcare workers and others who came together during the pandemic because they were concerned about the need to protect healthcare workers from COVID's airborne nature and they therefore had concerns also about appropriate protective equipment. And I've got th uh, three questions on the types of masks provided to healthcare workers. Okay. Thank you. Now, my first question is about the feedback that you sought from healthcare workers in the context of paragraph 137 of your fifth witness statement, where you mention the National Social Partnership Forum, uh, which you say is the established mechanism for the department to discuss issues affecting staff, brings together the department, main healthcare trade unions, NHS employers, arm's length body partners. And then you say, and I'll quote, the forum discussed issues relating to PPE regularly uh, and particularly how staff concerns could be addressed. So what were the outcomes of those deliberations on PPE how were the staff concerns over the level of protection dealt with? And were those concerns adequately addressed in the forum? Well, it's a good question whether they were adequately addressed, um, but they were addressed. Um, the amount of uh, IPC, sorry, the amount of PP was effectively determined by IP, the IPC process, um, which I took as read as, a, as clinical advice. Uh, of course, the availability of the higher end masks was uh, extremely tight at the start of the pandemic and had we for instance specified uh, FTP3 masks right from the right from the get go um, there would have been a risk that in extremely high risk settings um, there would not have been a, the availability of those masks um, had they been used across the board when um, the, 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 the lower grade masks were available more widely. So those sorts of uh, trade-offs do need to be considered. Um, but I think that, um, but, but that was the formal process. I think I also say in my witness statement, there was also obviously m m informal and, um, and other advice that we took. The formal process was only, the formal, the formal forum was only part of the way that we understood feedback on this basis. All right. Well, I'll move on to the next uh, question, which is about the data you were provided with. And again, in the same witness statement, paragraphs 115 to 116, uh, you state that data on nosocomial infections was consistently used to inform policy, yeah. identifying outliers and impl implementing best practice. Yeah. And you say that you discussed nosocomial infections frequently with Sir Simon Stevens and Dame Ruth May. Yes. And that in June 2020, you quote, pushed for us to look at data on the impact of use of masks in hospitals on infections. Yes. Now, you've given uh, in your statement two examples of that. One, a meeting on the 11th of June, uh, which in fact the minutes, which we don't need to go into, say um, it's headlined the SOS nosocomial infections meeting on the 11th of June. Right. And then in November 2020, so um, five months or so later, um, there was a, a, a discussion with um, uh, Amanda Pritchard and Ruth May. And so my question is this. From your evidence yesterday, i.e. your understanding was that FFP3 masks provide a higher degree of protection than FRSMs, uh, this would appear to be particularly important as an issue. Can you say what data you were provided with about masks and their impacts? And how did that data affect what you did? Yes, there was regular updates of... Um, uh, of, of data on those uh, matters. Um, the, you, you quote two meetings. There were many other discussions uh, in between that, both formally and informally. Um, and um, 
I think the, the reason that the June meeting is quoted is because around that time, um, I pushed hard for and succeeded in getting the agreement of the NHS to insist on masks for everybody in hospital in all settings um, where there might be a risk to patients. So that was a, um, there was a strengthening of that um, advice, um, which I worked on with Ruth May, as you say. So um, the, the, in, uh, you'll find, in the paperwork, there's a, the, there are the examples. I don't have them to hand today. Yeah. All right. And then thirdly, and this goes back to a question you were asked in module two by Mr. Stanton, who uh, has asked you questions this morning for the British Medical Association. Uh, and it's this, given that FFP3 masks are, in, in, in your view, the best protection against an airborne virus, and there being evidence that COVID was airborne, um, do you, there was a stop order placed on the purchase of such masks in June 2020. And you were asked why that was. You didn't know the answer at that point. Do you know the answer now? Uh, no, I don't. I, I would bring one. I would bring one other thing to your attention. Uh, FFP3 masks are not uh, the best protection against COVID. The best protection against COVID is to stop the virus in its tracks by bringing in. Well. Uh, lockdown measures. No, we don't, we, we we don't, understand that. Yes, we won't go into that. We're talking about protecting within masks, equipment. within the field of masks, within the field of masks. Uh, FFP3 masks aren't the most effective. There are stronger masks as well. So uh, it, you know, it, it, this isn't a binary question. Uh, I've no idea why, if or why, a stop notice was uh, put in place. And if I had seen it, I doubt I would have approved it. But I oh. haven't seen the paperwork. Well, that. you've answered the question. Thank you yeah. very much. Did you say yesterday, Mr Hancock, that you understood the IPC guidance um, took into account the factor of supply? Because that is not consistent with the evidence I heard from people who were on the IPC committee. Um, well, my understanding is it took into account the, the real-world situation that we were in. So, for instance... Well, wait, did, where did you get that impression? Uh, that's my recollection from the discussions I had at the time, m'lady. The um, with whom? Could you remember? Well, I discussed these matters primarily with um, Ruth May, Simon Stevens, and Chris Whitty and Donna Kinnear. I would. They were the four people I would have relied on for this uh, on this sort of issue. So it wouldn't have been the people directly providing the IPC guidance. Um, uh, no, because that guidance was provided to me through, in particular, through Ruth May. So, so your impression was, I'm not using the, the term pejoratively, but it was second-hand. It, it, was, it, was, it was indirect, yes. Um, and, but, a, but an apposite example is the point about FFP3 masks. If there's only a certain number, then the, the, that sort of guidance would take into account the, the places where they were most in need and could save most lives. That's, that was my understanding of it. If that understanding is incorrect, that was the impression that I had. And I, um, there may be a difference between what was considered formally and what was broadly taken into account in these decisions. The paperwork will only show part of, the, uh, part of that. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Um, Sen Gupta, over there. Thank you, my lady. Mr Hancock, I represent the Frontline Migrant Health Workers Group. Our clients' members include outsourced non-clinical workers not directly employed by the NHS yeah. and largely from ethnic minority and migrant backgrounds such as hospital cleaners, porters, security guards and medical couriers and clinical nursing and healthcare assistance staff, all of whom are from a migrant background. Mr Hancock, my clients and their members have numerous questions for you in relation to your conduct during the pandemic. However, in deference to Her Ladyship and the inquiry team, we restrict our questions today to those we've been given permission to ask you, updated to reflect your oral evidence so far. From your answers yesterday, it appears clear that at least from the spring of 2020, you were aware that migrant healthcare workers were suffering disproportionately high infection and mortality rights, rates. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, and I cared uh, a huge amount for it. I think that uh, the uh, the non-clinical 
um, employees working in NHS settings are often overlooked in these, in these debates, and those who you represent deserve a stronger voice, and so I was very worried about it, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr Hancock. You were worried about it. What practical steps did you take to address your worry? Well, the most important thing we could do was bring down infection rates in hospitals. Um, hence, for instance, uh, the, uh, the IPC measures that we've discussed that first came in in March 2020 um, took into account the risk of asymptomatic transmission in a way that they didn't amongst wider society. There's one example, uh, but there were, there were others. That's not specific to migrant healthcare workers, though, is it, Mr Hancock? It's, what, it, what specific it, steps did you take focused on that group? Uh, I, I took steps focused on all those who worked in the NHS, especially in those uh, roles where the voice may not be as strong because they may not have the same um, representation. Um, and my, my, as with the discussion... Um, Yesterday, on uh, issues of ethnicity in the NHS, my attitude was not to um, uh, try to prioritise one group or community over another. Uh, it was to try to support all those in those roles, no matter and irrespective of the colour of their skin or where they were born. Thank you, Mr Hancock. You referred to steps, and I'll ask again, what specific steps did you take in that regard? Uh, Absolutely central to this was bringing in lockdown, lockdown measures. I know that I keep repeating it, but it is absolutely core to how you can respond to a problem like this. The second is um, bringing in PPE measures that took into account the risk of asymm asymptomatic transmission uh, within hospitals that I've just uh, mentioned. Um, the, the third was supporting research into how the disease spread so this was critical and, in fact, goes to the questions that we've just been discussing from the COVID-19 Airborne uh, Transmission Alliance, because in the early days, we did not understand how it was transmitted. Uh, and there was a, um, there was an, uh, a, a presumption that transmission was more based on um, touch than on aerosol. Um, and when the research came to light to show the importance of aerosol transmission, uh, we again, took steps uh, related to that. So th th this, was a, this was a core part of trying to reduce nosocomial infection, but it is a, it's, a, it, it's a very difficult problem to crack. Mr Hancock, do you accept that migrant healthcare workers who had precarious immigration status were more vulnerable to employer pressure to work in higher risk environments than their non-migrant colleagues? I can absolutely see how that could be the case, yes. As the Minister for Health, what practical steps did you take to address that? Well, as I say, even before the pandemic, I was worried about this. Um, and I had taken steps to highlight it to the NHS as employers, uh, including uh, uh, publicly describing what I wanted to see and uh, in introducing, encouraging the NHS to introduce a chief people officer for the first time um, who, as it happened herself, was from a, uh, a migrant background, but that's, um, but that's less important than the fact she uh, took action within the NHS to try to tackle this problem. But I'm afraid to say, I have to tell you, in all honesty, there is still a huge amount to do on this agenda. Mr Hancock, when the pandemic hit in early 2020, around half the UK's hospital sites had outsourced ancillary services, including for cleaners, caterers, <laughs> security staff. And those workers invariably worked for minimum wage and as outsourced workers did not have the employment protections of NHS employed staff. As the Minister for Health, what practical steps did you take to protect these particularly vulnerable workers? Well, one step, for instance, um, was to support the increase in the minimum wage and the introduction of the national living wage, which I campaigned for um, again before the pandemic. That's one example. The second is that in um, discussing people issues within the NHS, I was always at pains to um, take into account those not directly employed. Um, this wasn't always the natural inclination of, of employers within uh, the NHS. Um, and in fact, yesterday's discussion around 
um, pharmacists not employed directly by the NHS uh, is one example where I said pharmacists should get um, uh, support as a whole and then uh, the system turned that into pharmacists directly employed should get support and within three days I'd managed to change that back again to my original instruction. This is a, a this you know that that's one granular example I, I I I reiterate because it's front of mind. But there's endless things like that that you have to do if you want to support people uh, who are who who are uh, who are themselves supported uh, by the organisation that you represent. Mr. Hancock, PPE. You told her ladyship yesterday. Our responsibility was to make sure that there was as much PPE available as possible. Yes. You also said preventing nosocomial infection is a key responsibility for the NHS. Yes. Outsourced workers dealing with NHS patients, both in NHS and private hospitals, reported that they were not provided with adequate PPE. As the Minister for Health, what efforts did you make to ensure that outsourced workers in hospitals were provided with appropriate or indeed any PPE? Well, again, my responsibility was to ensure that there was PPE broadly available and that as a nation, we didn't run out. The dis of course, the distribution of that uh, matters and ensuring that policy uh, supports and allows for the distribution of PPE to all those who are um, who are vulnerable and need it, uh, was important. Um, one example of this is that we set up PPE supply chains from the, from the government uh, to organisations, including many of those that uh, employ the, those who you represent, um, who before the pandemic would have bought their PPE entirely privately. Um, so, you know, in, in normal times, most organisations buy PPE as a normal purchase uh, with no intervention from the government whatsoever. And before the pandemic, the NHS supply chain um, supplied only the state-owned NHS hospitals, about 250 of them. We expanded that to include around um, 60 to 70,000 organisations uh, to which the state supplied PPE. So that's one of many examples. Thank you, Mr Hancock. Thank you, my lady. Uh, Miss Woodward, who's at the back there. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Hancock. I ask questions on behalf of COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice Cymru. And my question is about communications with the devolved nations. And it relates to evidence that Frank Atherton, the CMO for Wales, gave to the inquiry during this module. The transcript of Dr Atherton's evidence can be found at tab 62 of your bundle, Mr Hancock, and for others' reference, it's PHT 00000008. I'm afraid I'm going to have to read out a length of Dr Atherton's evidence to you uh, to give my question context. When asked about instances where the approach in Wales diverged from the approach in England, Dr Atherton said this. Testing was a bit of an issue, the testing strategies generally. Although information on the public health basis flowed very smoothly, I think, <clears throat> between the chief medical officers, sometimes because the work was being undertaken so rapidly, policy leads at UK level in England, let's say, didn't communicate as rapidly as I would have liked with colleagues who were working on similar issues in Wales. And that did lead, I think, to some divergence and some difficulties in keeping up with what everybody was doing. When he was asked about a solution to that communication issue, Dr Atherton said, I think in the same way that chief medical officers met and continued to meet regularly, there needs to be more communication between policy officials, policy leads between the four nations. I think to some degree that is already happening, but that would make far more sense. It's very difficult in the heat of a pandemic because work was often being directed by, say, the Secretary of State at UK level. And it was very difficult, I think, for policy leads, um, for policy officials there to always remember to link up as closely as they might with policy leads in the other devolved nations. It's something we need to continually work on as civil servants. 
We can see from this passage that in relation to testing, Dr Atherton appears to suggest that there were delays in information being communicated from policy leads at the UK and in England, including the Secretary of State, to those working on similar issues in Wales, and that this led to divergence and difficulties in testing policy between the nations. My question is this, Mr Hancock. Do you agree that these communication difficulties were as a result of delays from the UK government, including yourself? Well, I agree with it, precisely with the statement as read out uh, from the CMO uh, for Wales. Um, uh, your interpretation is, isn't quite right, um, because it's true that there could be decisions that I had to make very rapidly as the UK Secretary of State, some of which would um, be, involve um, have an impact on uh, devolved issues uh, because my role was both as the Secretary of State across the UK and directly responsible for um, the uh, operation of the the strategic operation of the NHS in England rather than um, across the UK as a whole. Um, but what he said, and I think is right, is that there was good quality communication with CMO between the CMOs. There was also high quality communication amongst ministers. We had a uh, exactly as he set out and recommended, we had a weekly uh, Zoom meeting. I personally uh, went at the start of the pandemic in anticipation of this problem to go and visit each of the other three uh, ministers. And we had an excellent rapport, which can be seen on the, um, on the WhatsApp channel that we communicated on very, very frequently. Um, the point that he's making is that at, is amongst policy officials uh, maybe that needs to be strengthened too. Uh, personally, I can't, um, I, I, I'm not sure what, uh, I, what, what communications that were at that level. Um, I, you know, I, we had policy officials sit in on those uh, weekly calls as well, but I'm sure that it can be uh, improved. Um, the point he was making about decisions by the Secretary of State, sometimes I had to make very rapid decisions, and that therefore inevitably makes this sort of communication harder, uh, and that is absolutely true. Um, Mr Hancock, from your perspective, um, what were the challenges um, that you faced personally or that you were aware of from your team in communicating effectively and quickly with the Welsh Government if we set aside the fact that, of course, some decisions were being made by yourself very quickly? Yes. So, um, personally, I didn't find uh, difficulties at the when decisions and discussions were happening at the ministerial level. Um, I had an excellent relationship with Vaughan Gething, who was the health minister for almost all of the time, um, and we would uh, speak or message directly if we needed to, or we'd communicate in more formal settings, including the weekly meeting. Um, and I would say that we supported each other through b both going through similarly uh, extremely challenging uh, circumstances and having to make enormous decisions in, 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 uh, between unpalatable options. Um, the um, w whether there could then at the next level down be better communication, um, if that is the evidence of uh, of the CMO in Wales, then I wouldn't dispute it. Um, to give an example of that in substance, one of the particular challenges between England and Wales was the provision of testing at the border, because for many people, their closest testing site might be on the other side of the border. For instance, the data integrations between the NHS in England and Wales are were poor and need to be uh, radically um, improved because if you live in, say, uh, Chester and work in Wrexham, uh, your data needs to move from one to the other. As it happens, I had a flu jab in Wrexham earlier this week and I'm a patient in England um, and who knows whether that data will make it onto my medical record, my English medical record. Um, so, but those are, that's a highly technical, specific example, but that is the level of detail that we'd get into. Thank you, Mr Hancock. Thank you, my lady. Those are my Hi. questions. Uh, Mr Weatherby. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr Hancock. Um, I ask questions on behalf of the COVID-bereaved Families for, for Justice UK. Um, 
The first topic was um, covered by um, Ms. Carey yesterday, asymptomatic transmission. And I think you agreed that decision and policy making in that respect should have proceeded on a precautionary basis. Have I understood that? Right? Yes, and should in future. And should in future. What I wasn't so clear about is whether you accepted that as Secretary of State, um, looking back on it, you should have ensured that, in fact, that is what happened. My challenge, looking back on it, is that I was facing a, a, a global consensus to the contrary. Um, I pushed hard. You know, one of the challenges you have as Secretary of State is that um, there you have to work out where you can push and how far you can go. Uh, reflecting on it, of course, it would have been far better yes. if we'd had that presumption. You're acting on an absence of evidence, or what was being told to you as an absence of evidence. But I know, looking back, if I really search for what I really felt and knew at the time, I had a strong instinct that this was the problem. Yes. The problem is, it, looking back, if I had simply said there was asymptomatic transmission, yes. clinicians, right up to the World Health Organization, would have said, you don't have the evidence for that, Secretary of State. Yeah, but that's the point, Mr Hancock, isn't yeah. it? Uh, we're talking about an absence of evidence. Rather Absolutely. Than rather than evidence of absence. And generally... And that was your role as Secretary of State to push back and say that. And generally, my approach was to take the reasonable worst-case scenario. Yes. And the reasonable worst-case scenario should have included the possibility... It should. ..of asymptomatic transmission. And, and just let me take this one step further. In, in terms of aerosol or airborne transmission, would you also agree going forward... Um, that the learning point is that with a newly emerging respiratory disease, the same should apply. Yes, absolutely, for a respiratory disease, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, topic two, um, capacity. And again, you've been asked a lot of questions about this, so I can deal with this quickly. Uh, and about the need to incre increase capacity and the evidence you've already given about Nightingale hospitals. Um, in module one, the inquiry heard from Professor Sally Davis, the... Um, CMO until shortly before the pandemic, <coughs> who told us that, and I'm quoting, compared to similar countries per 100,000 population, we were at the bottom of the table on numbers of doctors, numbers of nurses, number of beds, number of ITUs, number of respirators, ventilators, unquote. Do you agree that those were all key factors in the capacity problem in the NHS uh, and, and, and why you needed to increase NHS capacity after the pandemic struck? Uh, yes. Um, my uh, response to that would be is that that is absolutely true. Uh, it's one of the reasons I campaigned for the 10,000 extra beds in the summer of 2020 ahead of the, um, the second wave. Um, and... Um, Can we focus on the position effectively at 1st of January 2020? OK, well, it, and, in then? and in response the to that, I was yes. I, yes, I was going on to say we were in the middle of expanding um, those numbers very radically from the time when Sally left office. For instance, I'd committed in 2019 to 50,000 more nurses. Yeah. That has now been delivered, but I'm strongly on the record in favour of exactly that argument. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, and, and if we hadn't been bottom of the table in respect to those matters, uh, the need for the extra capacity that you then applied your um, mind to would at the very least have been mitigated, wouldn't it? I, I, I think mitigated is a good word because I would still argue in favour of it as a, an insurance policy. Yeah, so again, the answer is, is yes. Is it, yes, it is, yes, very much so. Third topic. Uh, visiting arrangements. And, and again, um, a lot of this, a lot of the points I was going to ask you about have already been dealt with, so I shall yeah. repeat those. But one really, one specific point. Um, the inquiry has heard quite a bit of evidence about the problems of restrictions on support and visiting um, for those with learning disabilities, um, and that includes the individual um, referred to by Ms Carey in the questioning she asked you yeah. about Susie Sullivan, um, who uh, had Down syndrome uh, and whose family I represent. Yeah. 
Um, do you agree that from the outset, guidance uh, on visiting arrangements during the pandemic should have contained specific provision for people who needed additional support, including those with uh, Downs, those with learning disabilities, those with dementia, uh, in order to ensure their safety and well-being um, so far as was possible? Yes. What I'd say is that these um, um, rules were drafted very rapidly, um, and one of the important pieces of work that could be done um, ahead of the next pandemic is to draft such rules so they're on the shelf, so to speak, so much more nuanced rules can be put into place yes. very rapidly with appropriate consultation uh, whilst we've got time yeah. to do it. Yes, well, um, no doubt that's a very sensible um, suggestion, Mr Hancock, but why, weren't, why wasn't that done prior to this pandemic? Uh, because the anticipation of a pandemic We've been through that in module one. There wasn't. There was huge amounts of areas where the. Were you worked up. aware um, of the problems uh, created by the restrictions on um, visitation for those needing support or those with learning disabilities? Did Did you become aware of that during the pandemic? I did, and I'd worked uh, hard on the question of um, uh, support for those with uh, learning difficulties and inpatient. Um, settings in particular ahead of the pandemic, so it was an area that I was well versed in. Okay, but what, once the pandemic was on us and, and these problems arose, did you become aware that the visiting restrictions were having such a deleterious effect on people in, who need this kind of support? Did you become aware of that? Um, I can't remember being presented with specific evidence of individual cases, um, and the debate was more at a higher level about the balance between the spread of the virus yes. and the need for visiting, Look, much as in uh, in the case of yeah. maternity. I, I don't want to be unfair, and you had an awful lot on your plate, but do you think you should have been aware of it? Well, uh, the, uh, the it, this would have been brought to me as a policy issue rather than individual cases, which would have rightly been the responsibility of those on the ground. Yes, and do you think the policy problems should have been brought to you? Well, the, the, at that time, the the team had a very difficult task to do to work out which issues needed to be brought to my attention because I was, if you're working an 18 hour day, there was still a massive limitation on bandwidth. So these decisions did have to be taken and, I, and um, probably uh, appropriate to be taken at a junior ministerial level. Yeah. Is, is the real answer yes, this is a real problem, a problem we, we've heard really affects the welfare uh, and mortality rates of people with learning disabilities? Is the answer yes, it should have been brought to your attention? Uh, the easy answer for me to sit here and say would be yes. Uh, what I've been at pains to do during this um, inquiry is to try to explain what it's really like. And in, in this instance, I think if a, a civil servant had made a decision that this sort of matter would go to the Minister of Care, I think that would have been an appropriate decision. So it should have gone to somebody else? There's a ministerial team for a reason. If you try to put every decision through the Secretary of State, decisions just don't get made. I'll move on. Topic four um, and back to 111 services. I think um, that you've already confirmed that part of the reassurance to the public underlying the stay-at-home messaging was that those who needed NHS care could continue to access the NHS, yeah. including online and through first point of contact 111 and the devolved um, services, uh, similar services. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, and um, by way of example, and, and it's just one example, one of the families that I represent, um, her, her father followed the guidance, attempted many times to call 111, each time it took several hours to get through, his health deteriorated each time he was told to remain at home. And that's quite a typical report from family members. Yeah. Now, plainly, the plan relied on 111 being able to cope with the increased levels of demand. Uh, I'm not going to take you to that because Ms. Carey did yesterday, but the, the, the plan, uh, uh, re, the, the messaging and the reassurance for stay at home relied on 111 
uh, being able to cope with the increased level of demand. That's but right. not only on 111. So this brings to the point about um, the NHS as a whole being there. So 111 is, of course, a, a vital service and was... Um, First point of contact, your and, words. ..and weighed upon heavily. However, 999 remained available yes. and didn't have the same outages. So people who were facing an acute problem could switch from calling 111 right. to calling 999. Yeah, well, let's, let's focus on the first point of contact, the, the service that you were um, um, advising the public well, to it, use as the first point of contact, unless they had, for example, serious um, 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 immediate life-threatening um, problems, in quite. which case they would phone 999. OK, so let's focus on 111. Um, and I think you're agreeing with me, I'll put it again, um, that um, the plan relied on 111 being able to cope with the increased level of demand. Now, I repeat my previous answer that 111 was one service okay. within a range of services, and your request to focus only on 111 um, is not appropriate in the question that you give, because you have to look at the services provided by the NHS as a whole. Right. Well, I'm not going to ask the question yet again, but I am concentrating... You can, I'll give on the same answer. The point is you're Thank concentrating you. on 111. My point is that if you have a life-threatening condition and you can't get through on 111, you call 999, and, and uh, that is very broadly known. <coughs> Noted. We've been through that. Is it correct that there was no emergency pandemic planning around the use of 111, um, including no planning for increasing the capacity of 111 services? I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was true because 111 was brought in after the pandemic plan was written in 2011. Yesterday you um, gave evidence re regarding uh, some consideration of delaying the stay-at-home message by 24 to 48 hours to allow more time for the 111 system and no doubt the 999 system as, as well um, to get more ready. Yes? Yes, that's right. Um, can you help what could have been done in 24 hours or 48 hours to cope with the surge that Ms Carey took you through uh, yesterday, yesterday? Yes, well, again, this is an operational question for uh, Sir Simon <coughs> Stevens. It, he, in the, co in the COBRA meeting suggested that uh, delay for these operational reasons, and it was taken into account. Uh, to give examples of what could have been done, firstly, uh, there would have been more time to draft scripts, because 111 relies on, um, on, on scripts for call handlers to follow yeah. to give them guidance of how to answer questions. In the end, there was a matter of hours, and those scripts were put together um, overnight, uh, as opposed to having 24 to 48 hours yeah. to write them. The second thing, is that the operation to expand 111 and bring in more call centres yes. uh, could have been, uh, would have had 24 to 48 hours more notice to yes. uh, to put in place. So there's two examples. OK, so, um, but you're not sens sensibly suggesting that 24 hours or even 48 hours um, would have made a material difference to, to getting robust and appropriate scripts together, never mind call centres and further staff. You're not sensibly suggesting that, are you? Well, the question implies a, um, a, an easy world of um, being able to do what you fancy. That isn't what happens in a pandemic. Um, the reality uh, is that everything, nothing is done perfectly. Everything is done to people's best ability. Um, and as I say anyway, uh, the Prime Minister then made the judgment not to wait that period, yes. uh, understanding and taking into mind the operational improvements that could have been made. It wouldn't have been perfect, even after 24 or 48 hours, as you imply, um, but it would have been easier operationally, but we decided not to do that, and with yeah. hindsight, I think that was the right decision. Well, uh, it, 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 so far as we can see from the disclosed material, it wasn't until May that you considered whether the 111 service ha had been able to cope with the demand that was immediately put on it by this policy. Uh, and it was in the middle of May that you um, caused to be conducted a, a deep dive uh, regarding 111 capacity. Um, uh, and that appears to have come out of a quad discussion on the 18th of May. Does that sound right to you in terms of the timing? No. Um, the 
um, work to um, enhance and support 111 was immediate um, from the middle of March when that COBRA discussion took place and before that in anticipation that there'd be a huge surge of um, questions. Um, and uh, uh, work, the, the, there was immediate work to support 111 during that period um, that, again, was led by the NHS, by NHS England. Um, that work was successful. By May, we were able to then look back to understand what had happened yeah. as opposed to the, 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 the hand-to-mouth immediate okay. um, uh, response. I follow. Uh, in fact, it was a result of that deep dive that you ended up being informed on, I think, the 22nd of May of the 40% of 111 calls that had gone unanswered in March 2020, as we heard yesterday. Does that accord with your recollection? That, that, I have no reason to doubt that. Yes. Um, sticking with 111 for a moment, my next point, um, the quality um, of the service. Um, again, you were referred to the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch <laughs> investigation published in September of 2022, and you referred to it yesterday in, in, in evidence, um, uh, with regard to this strong messaging, which may have discouraged some people from seeking um, treatment. But it's not that point I want to ask you about. The same report made a number of critical findings um, in relation to the 111 server, service, including that the COVID response service which was a, an add-on, if you like, to the 111 service. Yeah. Um, uh, it didn't function as intended. Yes. Uh, and that there were basic deficiencies in the advice and that callers were not asked about comorbidities. Uh, and there was comment about the needs of specific groups, such as those with learning disabilities or whose first language wasn't um, English. Are you aware of those criticisms of the 111 uh, service by the HSIB? Yes. Um, I think you have to set them against the fact that, thank God we had 111 in the first place, um, and it did an amazing amount of work. The, the, the correct thing to do is to um, thank those who worked in 111 for their service and be grateful that we had it, and then to seek to improve the response in the future. I think yes. the, the point that you make specifically about the uh, the pandemic response line is an important one that I haven't seen drawn out yet in any of the discussion, which was that there was a PHE contract for a pandemic response line in anticipation of the need for a, for a phone line, um, and it did not integrate well. Yes. And <clears throat> one of the lessons should be to be ready to expand 111 with with draft scripts that could draw from the learnings from, I've no uh, doubt that from, that's, from the pandemic. I've no doubt you're right that that's a, that's a lesson that could be drawn. But can, before we get to that, um, can you help us that during your time as Secretary of State, what um, quality assurance mechanisms um, were put in place yeah. um, to, um, so that you could be satisfied as Secretary of State of the quality and functioning of the 111 service? Well, the 111 service was uh, contracted by NHS England, so it would be their responsibility to do that. Um, the, uh, what I'd say, though, is that, um, again, it, this was put in place very rapidly in yes. short order. Um, and just as uh, we were earlier discussing, you've got to take 111 in its context with the 999 and, of course, physical services and being able to call your GP. And the other side, there's also now much more widespread uh, online availability of information. And for many people, not being able to reach 111 would lead them to uh, search on the NHS website. We saw that journey many times as well. So you've got to yes, see, see just... the information provision in the round rather than simply looking at one sentence. And I should focus on the question. The, the question was that, that this is a big part of your <laughs> policy uh, of stay at home. It's one of, one of the mechanisms to underpin that policy. And I entirely understand that it's being rolled out very rapidly. But... 
you need to roll out quality assurance rapidly as well, don't you? Because otherwise you may roll out something which doesn't work, as in, as in fact, to some extent, seems to have been uh, what happened here. I repeat my previous answer, which is that the question implies a world of, um, of time and, um, uh, and, and easy consideration, which is simply not the world that anybody inhabits when they're trying to respond to a, a pandemic. This was a deadly pathogen, and we were bringing in measures from January 2020 with enormous rapidity, and I'm very grateful for those who did that work and did it so well. Can it be improved? Of course it can, because anything done in a massive hurry can be improved, as it was during the pandemic. So the lesson is to um, have a plan for services like 111, in, including a surge capacity plan. Precisely, yes. Um, but also a plan to quality assure it, so you know that you're actually not wasting your time. Well, you, that, that implies that there's a binary between putting up st stuff that's useful and putting up nothing at all. Actually, um, putting, uh, putting together scripts very rapidly, putting things on the internet, uh, on the website very rapidly, and then improving them iteratively is in practice what you do in these circumstances. There isn't, there isn't, there's, there may be time for somebody like the CMO or um, another um, qualified clinician to look over um, uh, prepared documents that are prepared in in a very very short window of time. Um, of course, you can do a formal quality assurance uh, later, but in many cases we had to do things far far faster than yes. you do in normal circumstances. And that, that if you don't take that into account, then well, the, and the, then the point you're making doesn't really make sense. Well, the the the, the question was actually um, aimed at how you optimise. Yeah. Um, the services that you were able to um, uh, provide, even given the lack of planning and the lack of capacity. Yes. So uh, my, uh, yes. having, a, having uh, no assurance meant that you simply didn't know whether these services were working properly or optimally in the circumstances. Well, firstly, there was not no assurance because uh, senior clinicians looked at these materials before they went out. And secondly, um, the, uh, the 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 way that the world works in practice um, is that you get the best information you can out if you have to move very rapidly, and then you improve it over time. Um, it is not a sequential uh, process with the uh, with the benefit of uh, of time. Now is the moment to do the work that requires. Um, time and use time to consult yes. uh, with bodies. Now is the moment to As do that. As you correctly one. said, we discussed that in module one. Um, next topic, DNA CPRs. Uh, again, you were asked a number of questions yesterday about this, uh, and you stated that you were aware from early April 2020 that there were concerns being raised about the inappropriate imposition of DNA CPRs and potentially blanket um, orders. And this is something that chimes with well over 400 of the family members that I represent who've raised such concerns. But this was an issue, wasn't it, that was on your radar long before um, April of 2020, because in May of 2019, yeah. there was the NHS uh, Learning Disability Mortality Review, sometimes referred to as the LEDA, uh, and that had identified um, a, a whole host, about 19 instances where learning disabilities or Down syndrome were given as a rationale for a DNA CPR order. Yes. Uh, and you knew about that, didn't you? Because in fact... Not only did I know about it, I acted on it at the time, absolutely. And uh, well, I'm did... coming to that. Right. So on the 12th of February of 2020, the government, your department, issued a response to that report. And um, in that report, um, I'll give the reference just for the record. It's INQ 0047447478. Uh, and in that report, at paragraph 2.47, your department describes the problem that I've just raised as being, quote, completely unacceptable. Yes. That was my view. And that would be your view. Very strongly held, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, as a result of that, the action that was taken, uh, so far as I understand it, was that the department wrote to trusts 
to say um, that this needed to be addressed. Yes, I think that was done again by my uh, by the junior minister. Yes, but it was something that I w was uh, cited on. Yes, indeed. So there, now we come to April, literally two months later. Yeah, uh, and other problems, but similar problems in some cases materialised in re in respect of COVID yep. um, patients. Uh, and so yesterday you then told us that you'd acted again in April and you made a number of <clears throat> public statements. Yeah. Um, but in fact, apart from that, um, nothing else was done until October when the CQC uh, started to investigate and report on the C DNA CPR issues. <coughs> That's the reality, isn't it? No. No. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, well, the reality is that as soon as I heard about this being a potential problem and these concerns being raised with me, I immediately acted uh, because I feel so strongly about this. Um, and I went public on it, uh, including using the platform of the daily press conference to yes. um, reiterate the total unacceptability of this. Um, and uh, the and I, I discussed it uh, with the NHS leadership, uh, whose responsibility it was to stop it from Mr. happening. Sir Simon Stevens. Um, I yes. Well, I, mean, I can help you with this because what in actual fact happens in early September or by early September, David Davis MP um, uh, raises a, a question about a number of um, allegedly inappropriate DNA CPRs, and that prompted an email discussion uh, which refers to you having a meeting with Sir, Sir, Sir Simon about this um, um, issue. Uh, and in that email correspondence, which um, was at tab 61 of your evidence bundle, INQ 00478907 for the record, it's clear that there was still no data available to assess the scale of the problem or to monitor any progress held by either the DHSC or NHS England. So, yes, you'd written in February to the NHS trusts. Yes, you'd use your public platform uh, to uh, recognise the issue. But then nothing had been done, apparently, to monitor or collect data or uh, again, assurance about uh, whether the problem was continuing or how it had been um, dealt with. That's the reality, isn't it? Uh, no. The reality is that when this issue was highlighted, I didn't use my public uh, platform to uh, discuss the issue, what the word was. I used my public platform to uh, instruct that this was entirely unacceptable. Um, there is no reason that the department would have data on this because it's a question within the NHS. Uh, and I took it up with the NHS. We, I'm afraid we come to the division of responsibilities between uh, the NHS and the department. M the departmental position was extremely and vocally uh, clear. And then when it was again brought to my attention, um, I took further action. So the... Um, so, so that's what I did, and that was what I was accountable for. I absolutely, um, looking back, I took the action that I um, that I ought to have taken, and there is um, uh, and there is no um, there is there is there is absolutely no reason why anybody should put in place um, one of these uh, measures without a properly yes. consented process. Well, I've put the point to you. The inquiry has the documents, but no yeah. monitoring, no data, no assurance, uh, and that's what, what happens in early September, and that's what triggers the CQC um, having a look at the issue. That's the reality, isn't it? The reality is that I raised this matter with those who were properly appropriate for ensuring that it didn't happen. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Weatherby. Uh, Ms. Kerry, any further questions from you? over the night and there's nothing I need to clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr Hancock, that completes the questions we have for you in this module, although I'm afraid I do know that we are going to be asking you questions in another. Thank you for your help so far. Thank you very much.
Uh, very well. Uh, noon on Monday. <coughs> All rise.